So today we're going to finish up this sermon series that we started, I don't know, four weeks ago on making room for that something more. And we've talked about a whole bunch of things, but they kind of all revolve around this idea of trusting God for more. Today we're going to talk about another one of those things, and it's making room for more prayer. But as I begin that discussion, how many of you guys know somebody that struggles with prayer? Right? You know somebody, not you guys, you guys are amazing, of course, but know somebody in your life that struggles with prayer. And I say that because sometimes we get so fixated on what he's not answering that we stop seeing what he is answering. And when we get fixated on what he's not answering or what he's delaying that answer on or what he said no to, sometimes that spirals us out, doesn't it? I was talking to a lady the other day. She's been praying for almost a year now for God to take away something from one of her kids. And Man, she's just, she's at wit's end, right? The, the situation's not getting better with her kids. She's just worried that, beyond belief. She, she's the mom, and so she cares in these different ways. And God just, I don't know, he's answered little ones, but not the big one, you know. And, and she, can, she said to me, you can see why people doubt. You see why people doubt. And so I think in prayer, sometimes we just get so fixated on that one thing that we forget all the things he's doing. Just as a reference point for a second, um, we've actually been in ministry now since 2000, or sorry, since 1997, and I've been part of two, three congregations, and during that time we've done two official studies on prayer effectiveness, and then and there's been a bunch of little ones that independently people have done, and, but the two big ones, we used to pray on Sunday morning for all the people in our midst, and in both of my last congregation and this one, when I first got here, God answered to the tune of like 91, 92, 93 percent in those studies, exactly what we prayed it on Sunday morning. Now, just a reference point, I, when you first hear that, you like, can hardly believe that he answers that frequently. But every single time we did this, both times we did the formal one and all the independent ones we've done, he answers at this amazing clip in our life. We pray it. He loves us as his kids. He answers. And yet when you talk to people individually and you talk to them about the effectiveness of prayer, they're like, I don't know. This one seems too big. This one's too scary. This one, I don't know if he's hearing. This one, he's not answering. This one, and it's always on that other 10% that either God has said wait or no to. And we get so fixated on that, we start being fearful of trusting, and we start being fearful of praying to, and we start being just fearful to pray. And so one of the big things I want to encourage you guys today with is I want you to make room for more prayer which comes from that trusting heart. And so I'm going to have a, this could be kind of like a difficult conversation on prayer today because I want to share with you some things that we don't often preach on, but it's right there in the Lord's Prayer if you, if you want. But so often when we pray, we forget there's conditions to answered prayers. For example, does God promise in his word that he answers everybody's prayers? What do you think? No, he doesn't promise that at all. In fact, there's very clear in scripture that God completely ignores some people's prayers in fact, the Bible says that God actually has laid out some conditions to answer prayers in our life. And I can see just by looking at some of your faces, this is new information. But there's things that sometimes that we get in the way of our prayer life, that we sabotage our prayers before they get going. We, we are the reason sometimes we don't see answered prayers in certain areas of our life. And so today I want to just kind of talk through some of these just to help you understand the way prayer works and, and this connection with God and that it's about relationship and all that kind of stuff. And so as I talk through these things, that I just want you to hear and kind of reflect in your life and try to figure out where am I getting in the way of some of these prayers, right? So one of the first areas that I'll talk about today, one of the first preconditions that God gives to our prayer life is this. You have to have an honest relationship with him. I'll, I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. In John 15, 7, it says just simply this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Aren't you floored as you read through scripture, some of these, these verses? God just says, I'll give you whatever you want, right? If you do these things, those are the conditions. In the Lord's Prayer, I referenced that earlier. Are we always forgiven? In the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Forgive me as I forgive those who sin against me. There's a condition on that forgiveness. He says, you can't, you can't not forgive people. That's not part of the program. And if you doubt that, at the end, when God shares the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, right after it shares that, it says, if you don't forgive somebody, I'm not going to forgive your sins. So there's a condition, even on the forgiveness that we thank God for every single day. It's one of the reasons we teach confirmands in confirmation class, you know, as we're talking about the Lord's Supper. Don't hold on to a grudge. It's one of the illustrations we use. If you're, if, you're, if you're unforgiving for somebody, it means you're not sorry for not forgiving somebody and you're coming to the altar to receive forgiveness. Do you see how that doesn't play? 
You want forgiveness for something that you're not sorry for? Anyway, it goes on to that. So he wants us to have this honest relationship with him. And as I just read that, John 15, 7, it's a beautiful promise. But in Scripture, with every promise, there's a condition. With every promise, there's a promise. And the premise here is, I will give you whatever you ask for in prayer if you remain in me. In other words, you have to have an honest relationship with me. So that begs the question, what does an honest relationship with God look like? Where we're not hiding anything from him. The next sentence tells us, by my words remaining in you, in other words, God says, if I fill my mind with the Bible, with God's word, then I will be in Christ, right? I will be abiding in him because the more I know his word, the more I hear his promises, the more I realize what he's done for me, the more I understand who he is and the extent of who he is, the more it blows the doors off all these things, this box that I put God in and I realize that he's able and that he cares and that he sees and that he knows and that he's, he's for me and he's not against me and on and on. And that's why the Bible is so important to get to know God. And so you start asking, well, are you saying that if I'm not in a Bible study, God will never answer my prayers? Well, no, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that your prayer life will never be more effective than how much you understand Scripture. And I'm telling you, the more you get to know God's Word, the more you'll hear His promises and know His promises and be able to count on His promises and put your trust in those promises, the more you realize just how amazing our God is and how much He's invested in you and how much He cares about you. The more it changes that relationship and it changes the way you pray. It's an amazing thing. So the more you understand the Bible, the more you'll know how to pray effectively. So there's a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you guys just to think about in 1 John. To kind of give us uh, something to evaluate ourselves on if we have an honest relationship with God with. And so here's the first question. Do I or have I refused to admit things that I have done wrong in the past? We'll call this the repentance clause. The Bible says that when we don't repent, it's called unconfessed sin. I want you to look at it like this. God is this amazing God, right? He's the perfect dad. He loves you more than anything. He's given you the road map to success in life. He's shown you forgiveness. He's given you the map to heaven. I mean, he's promised you everything. If you stay over here, you're in a good place. Yeah, your life's going to go better. It's, it, you're going to feel more peace, more strength, more hope, all that stuff. It's an amazing place over here. But for whatever reason, as we go through life, we start thinking we know better. And we're like, I hear you, God, but this looks really fun over here. And I think I might, or, or I hear you, God, but I think my idea is better. Or, or I hear you, God, but I don't trust that that's going to work in this particular case, so I want to take matters into my own hand. And every time we start walking this way, rebelling against what God has said to do, right, we have to harden our hearts against this amazing God that loves us. That's always for us and not against us. That's totally invested in life. That cares more than we can comprehend. We have to harden our hearts against him to go in this direction. And every time we do that, it's called sin, right? And every time we do that, it puts like a little wall between us and God. It separates us from God. That's what sin does. It, Luther said that every time we sin, it's an act of unbelief. So as we, we come into that, right, as we look at that, it starts creating this, this cover-up in our lives, right? Where we, we know this wrong that we've done in our lives, that we've done our own thing, it, but we don't want to change, and it's breaking this connection between us and God and we try to cover up things that we've done and, and, and it breaks that honest relationship that we have. God's just saying, come on home and have you ever done something that maybe you didn't want to tell your parents about? Why? Because they told you to do this and the, maybe you didn't do that and you got in trouble for this. I was terrified the first time I got a parking ticket, or a, not a parking ticket, a, a ticket from an officer. It was my first experience ever. I think I had my dri driver's license for two weeks and, and, and I, I was going to a basketball game with my friends. I was able to drive. I was so excited and, and I went to Chaparral because I went to Saguaro growing up. I mean, this is how, how long I've been here. And, and anyway, I, I went around this, this corner, but there was a stop sign and apparently I didn't come to a full and complete stop. And there was a police officer that was there and, and as I turned around the corner and started going, he turned on his lights and he, he pulled up behind me and you know, I had watched a show called Chips growing up and the older people will know that show and in that show, what you did is you got out of your car and you went back and you talked to the police officer, so that's what I did and I got out of my car and I headed back and the police officer dropped to one knee behind his, do his, his, his door and he pulled out his gun and he says, get back in your car and so all of a sudden I was feeling a lot of emotions, you know, at that moment and I, I and I got back into my car and he, he asked for my insurance and driver's and all that. And I didn't know where it was. I had just got my license. And so I was looking through the whole thing. And I'm sure he was laughing at me, but I was scared out of my mind. And anyway, went through that whole experience. Do you think I was excited to tell my parents about that? I was terrified. So I went home. 
And my, hey, my parents are gone for the weekend, so I lived with that for like three, three days before they got home. And, and I know I needed to tell them because, you know, it was going to have to go to a driver's class and they would know about it. And so they came home and I, I shared that information with them and I was terrified. I was just terrified. Thing is, though, if I hadn't confessed that, I'd be living with a separation between my parents and I, wouldn't I? I'd be feeling that guilt. I'd be waiting for the hammer to fall. I'd be waiting for them to find out. I'd, there'd be something disingenuous in that relationship. God doesn't want anything that's disingenuous, right? So he calls us to confess our sins. Here's the thing. God already knows it's happened. He was there when you did it. He just wants you to admit what he already knows. He wants you to come clean. And my mom, man, she was, I don't know if you had a mom, like, she just knew. I, I tried to lie to my mom once and she caught me and, 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 and never, never again could I ever lie to my mom because she was, she, I, she just knew stuff that there's no way you could know. I, I don't know how she did it. Apparently I'm a horrible liar so that probably lent into it. But the, the reality is you want that relationship. Or how about a spouse? You know, you do something that you're not proud of and you don't tell her and, and she's going to find out eventually but she just... And you live with that in-between, waiting for the hammer to fall, waiting for her to find out or him to find out, and you know it's going to be a blow-up, and you just, you live with that separation. And God says, I don't want it to be like that between us. I want you to know me, and I want to know you. And, and one of the ways that we do that is we just confess the stuff. We get rid of it. We share the stuff that he already knows, and we're saying, God, I'm so sorry. You were right, and I was wrong. In 1 John 1, 8, it kind of continues this line of thought. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. Truth is not in us. However, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I've we'll always loved that verse because it's part of the old Lutheran liturgy too, but it's, it's a reminder that God just wants us to come clean to receive his forgiveness, to get that new beginning, to get that fresh start so that there's nothing in between us. Confession is simply being honest with God and saying, God, you're right, I was wrong. That jealousy, that impatience I had was just wrong and I'm so sorry. So one of the first ways we can tell if we have that honest relationship with God is are we being honest when it comes to our mistakes? Let me give you another question. Am I currently in the present ignoring any of God's principles? He shared with us in the Ten Commandments, I mean, all the way through scriptures, the right way of living. It blesses us when we go this direction. It's an honoring to him and when we go this direction. It gives us peace and strength and all sorts of stuff when we go this direction. But are there areas in our life where we're deciding to do our own thing? In 1 John 3, 21 and 22, it says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask. Again, he says this. That's his promise. Because we obey his commands, that's the premise, and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another and as he has commanded us. So I, you start listening to these verses like that, and again, you're overwhelmed that he says, I'll do anything. But again, the premise is, is that we obey him and everything. And you start getting overwhelmed with that, and you start thinking, how in the world could I obey everything? I can't be perfect. I mean, I want to be sometimes, but... How in the world can I get there? If that's the condition to answer prayer, how can anybody get any answered prayers? And the thing with God is he does demand perfection. But he gets that we can't do it. Does that make sense? And so he wants us to have the spirit of obedience. I'll give you an example of that. A parent tells their four-year-old daughter to go clean their room, right? And a half hour later, they walk into the room and the kids largely picked up the room. There's still stuff falling over the place in different areas. I mean, she still has work to do, but you can tell she's been working at it for a half hour, making some progress. Do you get mad that it's not perfectly clean? No, no, because you see her effort. You know that she's been trying. If you walk in a half hour later and she's still watching TV and hasn't done a thing, do you get mad? Yeah, because you know she hasn't been trying. She hasn't even tried to obey you. She didn't listen at all. She didn't care. So God wants us to have this, this spirit of obedience. Does that make sense? This attitude of, I'm going to keep trying, Lord. And I'm going to fail, but I'm going to keep on going. And I'm going to keep on working at this. And, and if it's a sin that's got just roots in my life, I'm going to keep trying to overcome it, Lord, because I know it's complicating my life. And, and it's just bringing hardship on me. And I, so give me the strength to keep trying. So much of life is just about trying. It's when I watch my girls swim, I just want to know they're trying. When I, when I see them studying, I just want to know they're trying. I just want them to be triers in life because, man, there's too many people that go through life not doing that. And God wants us to try. 
And so I'll just call that whole thing kind of the, the condition of, of repentance. It's, it's getting out of that way between our relationship with God. It's, it's, it's making those things where we have this unfiltered, honest relationship with him where we know he sees us and he cares about us and he loves us the mess that we are. Isn't that one of the, uh, just to follow up this last piece, when you get married, isn't that one of the things that blows you away? First of all, if you're a guy, you can't believe she said yes in the first place, right? But, but then she gets to know who you are. It, it is dumbfounding you're still married after that first year, right? With all of your imperfection, with all the stuff that you don't do right, with all the guy stuff that you do that just, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is part of being married. You know, with all that stuff that she sees you for who you are in your weakness, and she still loves you. And wives, you got to feel the same way, right? It's one of the dumbfounding things about marriage that they still love us in spite of seeing everything, and God sees more than they see. He sees the secret stuff, stuff we don't share even with them. It's, and he loves us anyway, and he's forgiven us for some of those things that we've done that, that we don't even verbalize because we're so ashamed. He sees and he knows and he loves and he forgives and that builds this unfiltered relationship between the two of us and that's what he desires and that's what opens up his ears to hear our prayers. Let me give you another one. In Mark eleven twenty four 24 and 25, he just says this, you must have a forgiving attitude toward other people. Jesus says it this way. He says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I love that condition. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. More than any other characteristic in the Bible, except maybe faith, the number one thing related to prayer is forgiveness. Over and over again, Jesus talks about prayer, and he talks about forgiveness. It's even in the Lord's Prayer, as I cited earlier. Why? Because nothing kills your prayers quicker than resentment. When you hold a grudge, when you nurse a, a, an ill feeling, when you hold on to that bitterness, right, and lets it, let it grow in your life, it knocks off your prayers because God says, I died to forgive you. Forgive them. It's the greatest thing that Christians should be known by, right? Saying, I'm sorry and I forgive you. Those are two marks of being a Christian, not being perfect. We're a mess. Let's just be honest. But those two things we can do. I'm sorry and I forgive you. Because God says you can't say you love God and hate your brother at the same time. One of the primary reasons why we don't see answered prayers is because we allow bitterness to spring up in our life and we hold on to it. I mean, just think about people that you know have been divorced. Do you know anybody who's been divorced and is still holding on to hurt five years later? Ten years later? Fifteen years later? Sixty years later? They don't even have kids anymore spinning the knife. It's just... They just refuse to forgive. They refuse to let go. And it's not just divorce, man. It's, it's friends, it's coworkers, it's neighbors, you name it, siblings, parents. We've talked over and over about bitterness. And man, forgiveness releases you from that. It gets rid of all that anger and all that ugh, that we struggle with. And, and now Satan can't just press a button and spin us out because we've let it go. We've let them go. We've given it over to God to judge. It's, it's gone. But God says one of the biggest things in prayer, whether it means our actual forgiveness or answered prayers, is that bitterness, that unforgiving spirit, man, it hinders us, hinders him hearing our prayers. Let me give you another one. You must be willing to share the results. This is the principle of what you sow, you reap. Given it will be given to you. It's the principle of generosity. The more you give out, the more God gives to you. In other words, God blesses us so we can be a blessing to other people. I'll even reference this prayer jar. We've had it up a month, and we were worried when we first put it out, you know, would we fill it up by the end of the year? The question now is how many jars are we going to fill up, right? I mean, and I just talked to a guy on the way in. He's like, where's the prayer jar? I got to put some stuff into it. And so, and so we have people continually giving evidence in our, this place from the people that you're hanging out with that God's answering prayers left and right. It's an extraordinary thing. And when we see God do that, does he bring God glory? We're sharing the results with God. God loves to answer prayers, to bring himself glory, to give you, and why does he want glory? Just so he can pat himself on the back? So that you'll trust in him. So that you'll see that he answered this prayer, that prayer, and, and, and that you'll pray yourself and trust him with the more in your life. He loves to do that for his kids. He wants to increase your trust in that something more as you go through this life. Let me give you an example of that. 
you know a pastor who tells a story of a man who is literally multi, a multi-millionaire. And the interesting about, thing about this guy is that he gave away 97% of everything he made. 97%, that's extraordinary. And he still lives, and he lives on 3%, and he still has a higher standard of living than probably most of us here today. And you start asking, why would you do that? Or how did you do that? How many of you guys could move to a 97% tithe tomorrow? Like nobody, right? And so he tells us, he says when he was a young man, he began to give from the blessings that God had given him. He found that he couldn't outgive God. He said that the more he gave, the more God blessed him. And so he increased his tithe from 20 to 30 and now over 90% and he's still a multimillionaire. And he just says, if you want God to bless you, you must be willing to be a channel of blessing for other people. Why is that so important? It, it changes our prayers, doesn't it? It's not all about us. Is God heal me so I can take care of my grandkids? Is God, is God answer this prayer so that I can provide for my family? It, it's God, do this so you can bring glory to yourself and more people will trust you in this area of our lives. It's, it's being blessed so that you can be a blessing to others, so that you can encourage others to pray and put their faith in our God. It's, it's, it's this idea of generosity, not just in your giving, right? But, it, but just in your, your example to others that God's come through. Man, that glorifies God. And man, it encourages us when we see people and see miracles happen in this life. And this whole, this whole idea is the, is the principle of generosity. But when we give with a very selfish spirit, James talks about this. You don't give because you ask with selfish motives that you may get, with, that you may spend what you get on yourself. He says, I, I don't answer those prayers. That's why most of us haven't won the lottery so far, right? I mean, so, so the reality is God says when you pray, it can't just be about you. It's got to be about the others in your life. That changes the heart of our prayer. It changes the way we pray. And, there's, and when we're praying for healing, are we praying just for ourselves usually? Isn't it often for our spouse so they don't have to go through things without us? Isn't it for our kids so they don't have to grow up without a dad? Isn't it for our friends because they need that, that encouragement and that help but that buddy as they go through life is, a, is an encouragement and strength? Isn't it for other people? And it just changes the way we pray a little bit. Let me give you another one. Uh, verse 6, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So the fourth condition is something we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? But the fourth condition for answered prayer is you must believe that God will answer. It's almost an insane thing that we pray to God already believing he's not going to come through. God says, don't do that. When you come to me, trust me for who I am. Trust me that I'm not just able, but I'll do it. Mark 9, 29, it says, according to your faith, your trust in him will it be done unto you. Hebrews eleven six. without faith or without this trust, it's impossible to please God. You can't please God if you don't have faith. It's the number one uh, prerequisite for life. But some people will ask me, you said, pastor, what exactly is faith? Is faith believing that God, I don't know, can do it? No. God can do it whether you believe it or not. That's just an objective fact. I mean, God is able, so that is not faith. How about faith, God, or his faith, I believe that he might do it. No, that's more of a worldly hope. He might, if, if he's interested, if he's not too busy, if it kind of works within, you know, his daily plan. He, he might get around to doing it. That's not faith. How about this one? I believe that God will do it. Yeah, you have to have faith in that. You can't say, I believe God will do it and not put your trust in that. Otherwise, you don't say those words. You say he might or maybe he'll get around to it. But to say that he will involves trust. I honestly believe that sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers because we'd have a heart attack if he actually responded, right? And so sometimes I think he's just not answering some of our prayers to keep us alive. But the reality is that I think we see so little in our lives today because we expect so little in our lives today. And part of that's a fear for trusting him with the big things because we just don't know what we'll do if he doesn't come through. Sometimes it's just a fear because we just don't, we can't control it and we're afraid that God won't come through. There's so many things that we just, we put God in this little box because if we just trust him for this, we'll never get let down. We forget who we're praying to. We forget that he's the God of the universe. We forget that he's invested, that he loves us the way he does. We just... We get so narrow in our thinking and in our focus. But the Bible again says, according to your faith, not according to your ability and not according to your education, not according to how good a person you are, but according to your faith, your trust in him, will it be done unto you? I'm going to give you this last one. John 14. 
And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. I love that one. He'll do anything again. Did you hear that? You may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. This is the fifth condition for answered prayer. You must pray in the name of Jesus. You know, you start asking what's so special about Jesus' name. And I, I guess for a while I didn't get that. But, but I just remember I was in third grade and I used to struggle with these horrible nightmares. Just horrible nightmares. Um, you know, at school they'd show you don't get in the van. You know, run away. <laughs> all these kind of horrible stuff about kidnapping. So I was like all freaked out. And my mom eventually just came in. I just remember this one occasion and I think it was around third grade. And she came into my room and she said, you know, Mike, you can tell... You can say, in the name of Jesus, Satan be gone, and he has to leave with this horrible dream. And you know, if you say, in the name of Jesus, Satan has to listen to you. So just say, in the name of Jesus, Satan be gone, and he'll take away Satan, he'll take away that bad dream, and you can go back to sleep. So I just, I believe my mom, and I believe God would do it. And did you know, since third grade, I've been able to say that prayer, and God has always taken away the bad dream? Isn't that, isn't that dumbfounding? Sometimes I had to pray it a couple times, right? But every single time. And I can go back to sleep. A little trust in a big God can do anything. And that, that experience it helps me now when I'm spiraling through. I'm a control enthusiast. When I'm spiraling through my worries or whatever, when I realize what I'm doing, I trust that if I give them to him, he'll take them. He'll give me a peace and I can go back to sleep. And you know, for the last 10 years since I've been doing that, every single time I give him my worries, he reminds me that he's got it gives me a peace, and I go back to sleep. When we actually trust God that he'll do stuff, he opens up the storehouses of heaven, and he just provides. We receive so little so often because we don't believe that he'll come true. But this Jesus name thing is a big deal, right? Uh, I, I, let me share an illustration with you that maybe helps you understand this in a different way. A pastor friend of mine uh, took his son and 14 of his friends to the fair for his birthday party, right? And so he bought these tickets, and he'd go in front of each ride, and he'd hand out the tickets to his son and the 14 friends, and he'd just keep doing this over and over and over again. When all of a sudden he looked up and he saw this kid that was not part of his son's party. This was not his son. This was not one of the 14 friends. Never seen this kid before, and the kid's like this, waiting for a ticket. He's like, well, who are you, son? You're not, you're not with my son's party. He's like, no. So, so help me understand, why, why do you think I'll give you a ticket? And he goes, and he pointed to the, the man's son, and he says, because that, that boy said if I came over here and asked for a ticket, he'd give me one. So what did the dad do? He gave him a ticket, right? Here's the point. I don't have any right to get any answered prayers from God. God doesn't owe me anything, and he doesn't owe you anything. In fact, it's the other way around. We owe him a ton because of what he's done for us in Jesus. So when I come and I pray and I ask God requests, I don't ask on my own merit because I don't have any. But I come on the merit of Jesus Christ. He's done everything. I come and say, Father, I'm coming to you because Jesus, your son, said I could. I'm coming because of what Jesus Christ has already done for me on the cross. I'm coming because he's reconciled this relationship that was broken. And somehow, even though I am a mess, he's made me perfect in your sight so that I can ask in his name, I'm coming in the name of Jesus. You see how that changes our heart as we approach God in prayer? Sometimes I think we get a little demandy, you know, when we pray, God, do this, you know, come through. We treat him like a friend or even worse than that sometimes, but man, he's our father in heaven. And we forget our standing before God is zero without Jesus. And so just like my mom was talking about, when we come in the name of Jesus, man, he opens up his ears and he hears everything that we said because we're coming in the name of his son, who made everything right. You know, as we went through these, my, my question is, which one of these, right, have you been overlooking as you approach God in prayer? It's not quite as, as, as simple as you thought, right? It's a little bit more complicated when you start thinking about your relationship with God, but it's all about relationship, isn't it? God's just trying to, to clear the path, right? So it's just you and him. Where there's this honesty, where there's this love, where there's this care going back and forth. It's not a magic wand. It's not a, a tug of war. It's not a desperation shot. It's all about a relationship with God. See, God just wants you to know him personally. He wants to hang out, right? That's why he sent Jesus to this earth so he would know what he was like so that he could see how much he loved you, so that you could grasp hold of just how amazing that forgiveness he won for you on the cross really was. It's always been a better relationship. 
And it's through that relationship that we're healed. And it's through that relationship that we are saved. And it's through that relationship that all of our prayers one day will be answered. Jesus said this. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as my encouragement as we finish up this series is just keep on working at trying to make more room for that something more. Keep trusting him with the more in your life. He loves you. He's got you. He's invested in you. As we think about the capital campaign in the fall, pray that God comes through with us, right? But that he does that something more so that we go, there's no way we could have done that without him. Pray that he fills like all 15 of these jars up in here because that would mean that we're so blessed and so overwhelmed by his coming through that we keep on praying. Keep praying for our country, right? That's a whole prayer initiative that we've had since the beginning of the year. Keep praying for our country because it's a mess. It's just a mess. And we can't change it. We can't fix it. We can vote, but we need God to do something. We need God to change the dynamics somehow because he can. We, we can't. But we got to stop praying just for the little things and not expecting anything. We got to start praying for the big things and, and seeing what it is our God will do. Because here's your perfect dad. And he loves you more than you can comprehend. Think about those things today and let me pray. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for this series, Lord. It's been fun just... I don't know, challenging a little bit our trust in you, a lot of bit our trust in you, realizing how little we trust you at times. But Father, our prayer in the midst of the series is just help us, give us the strength, give us your spirit, whatever it takes to, to trust you with that little bit extra, to trust you with a little bit more in prayer, to trust you with the scary things, to trust you with the things that are beyond our control to trust that you not only are able, but that you see and you care and you know, unless you have something way better in store for us, you're gonna say yes. Give us that confidence and that perspective as we walk through this life. And we pray that today knowing that you hear us. And we pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen.